Thank you, Lyotan and uh, Keiko. Uh, I, let me start by saying uh, that uh, this is uh, a privilege for me to be with you today, uh, even though virtually at the virtual level. And uh, I hope uh, to uh, meet uh, your expectation in uh, giving my, I cannot say that this is a lecture, this is a seminar. Actually, I uh, will propose a simply some reflections uh, on this uh, uh, very challenging uh, topic. And uh, I hope uh, to receive from you uh, further inputs, uh, further reasons of reflections, reflections in uh, dealing with this uh, subject. As uh, uh, currently General Bramble recalled uh, at the very beginning uh, during uh, his uh, presenta presentation, um, everything uh, is uh, uh, well predictable, entirely predictable, not only COVID-19 but also uh, climate change. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I, I completely agree with you that uh, um, most states are completely unprepared to uh, meet this uh, challenge today. Um, first of all, uh, I will uh, offer uh, some uh, introductory remarks uh, on uh, this uh, topic. Uh, then uh, I will deal with the uh, uh, Security Council approach to climate change and security challenges in the Sahel region. Uh, very short remarks, I promise. Uh, then uh, I uh, um, will deal with the legal implications uh, for UN Security Council Resolution 2423 of 2018, which are the major uh, stance and open uh, challenges. And uh, afterwards, uh, I uh, um, will conclude with uh, some remarks. Uh, starting from uh, my introductory remarks, uh, I would uh, like, uh, I should like to recall uh, that uh, in recent years, uh, intercommunal conflicts uh, characterized by unprecedented violence uh, have uh, grown uh, at an alarming rate in uh, various parts of uh, West Africa and the uh, Sahel, uh, Sahel region. In uh, uh, 2018, uh, in central Mali, about uh, 43 attacks uh, were documented between uh, uh, herders belonging to the uh, Fulani community, and uh, that is uh, the largest pastoral group, pastoralist group spread across West Africa and Israel, and uh, farmers of the Dogon community. In uh, uh, 2019, the deadliest assault occurred in Ogosogu, where at least 145 civilians of the Fulani community were killed, and 95% of their houses were burned down. According to a preliminary investigation by MINUSMA, that is the UN peace operation that is deployed in Mali since 2013, uh, this assault was planned, organized and coordinated and could amount to a crime against humanity. According to the International Organization for Migration, more than 50,000 civilians were displaced in June 2019 due to intercommunal violence in central Mali. Clashes between different communities, between nomadic pastoralists and sedentary farmers across the Sahel region are driven by various economic, political and social factors, including a strong demographic pressure and the widespread presence in the region of the violent extremists and armed groups who find in local conflicts a fertile ground for their expansion strategy. These uh, uh, various uh, uh, elements include uh, um, the, the elements that I mentioned before, but uh, there is also another uh, series of factor within the root causes uh, of uh, these violent clashes, uh, that is uh, climate-related effects, including drought, 
desertification, land, land in, de in degradation, and uh, food insecurity. In the United Nations uh, documents, uh, there has uh, uh, always been a clear uh, connection between uh, armed conflicts and uh, environmental degradation. Suffice here to mention uh, the very well known Brundtland Report of 1989. What is difficult to prove instead is the existence of a direct causal link between climate change and conflict. There is, however, a growing consensus on a basic assumption. I quote from a statement by the UN Secretary General of 2009 when he presented his report on climate change and its possible security implications. I quote, the fact that the quantitative studies fail to confirm statistically significant links between environmental factors and conflict, and conflict does not mean that they do not exist. Rather, Climate change may be regarded as a threat multiplier, that is, as a factor that can work through several channels, social, political, and economic factors, to exacerbate existing sources of conflict and insecurity and exploitation. The growing consensus on this assumption is confirmed by various UN documents, by various statements by presidents of the UN Security Council, and by various documents released by other international organizations, first NATO and the European Union. In this context of particular interest is the incorporation of climate change as a security issue in one resolution, a resolution unanimously adopted by the UN Security Council in 2018, providing for the extension of the MINUSMA's mandate in Mali. In the preamble, the Council, the council especially recognized, I quote, the adverse effects of climate change, ecological changes, and natural disasters, among other factors, on the stability of Mali, including through drought, desertification, land degradation, and food insecurity. But what is more, in the operative part of the resolution, the Council recommended to the government of Mali and the United Nations, I quote again, to take into consideration as appropriate the security implications of the adverse effects of climate change and other ecological changes and natural disasters, among other factors, in their activities, programs, and strategies in Mali. Against this background, it may be useful to explore whether and to what extent climate change in, this, in its security dimension falls within the Security Council strategies and how this challenge has been addressed by the UN with regard to the UN region, with regard to the Sahel region. To this purpose, I will start from the assumption that security in Mali has an impact on the entire region, which in turn affects global stability. The attention will be uh, thus focused uh, on uh, the situation in Mali as a, a case study. And uh, in order to uh, assess the legal and practical implications of the Security Council recommendation that I mentioned before. An overall uh, assessment will be finally made on the Security Council approach to the challenge of climate securization in Sahel and its possible impact on the evolution of the, the UN uh, collect system of collective security. New wine in all bottles, or a first step towards a change in the security architecture of the organization. First, let me start uh, from uh, some uh, few remarks on the Security Council approach to climate change and security challenges in the Sahel region. 
Various uh, open uh, debates uh, on climate change and security have been uh, held within uh, the uh, Security Council uh, since uh, 2007, uh, when uh, the uh, UK, yeah, for the first uh, time, uh, invited uh, other uh, members uh, of the body to explore the relationship between uh, energy, security and uh, uh, climate. Uh, in the subsequent years, uh, other uh, public uh, debates or uh, open debates and briefings uh, were organized within the challenge on uh, this uh, issue. Uh, but uh, it is also uh, necessary to uh, recall uh, that uh, uh, the legitimacy of uh, the UN Security Council to address uh, this uh, issue is uh, uh, challenges by is context uh, is contested by uh, some permanent members, uh, in particular the Russian Federation and uh, China. What are the arguments at the basis of uh, this uh, um, this uh, challenge? First of all. Uh, uh, for instance, the Russian Federation maintains uh, that uh, the Council uh, has neither the specialized expertise uh, nor the tools uh, to put uh, together solutions uh, for effectively combating climate change. Second, there is a problem of uh, um, respect of the principle of division of labor among the UN bodies. That is, the UN General Assembly and the Economic and Social Council, in the opinion of Russia, are in a better position to tackle this topic. It is uh, against this background that we need to consider the adoption of Resolution 2423 that I mentioned before, because this resolution was unanimously adopted in 2018, so with a positive vote by Russia. But after the adoption, the uh, Russian representative uh, um, made a statement, made a, strand, a strong statement where he uh, challenged a so-called abuse by uh, the penholders of the draft resolutions, uh, resolution, that is, uh, the uh, members of the Security Council who produced the text of the draft resolution. Um, in particular, uh, Russia maintained that uh, uh, the Russian Federation uh, is uh, uh, in agreement with the need to uh, support the UN efforts in uh, Mali and uh, in particular to give a strong support to the undertakings, to the actions uh, um, conducted by MINUSMA. But this uh, uh, recommendation uh, was, uh, um, was not, uh, uh, it was not the right moment to include this recommendation in the operative part of a resolution on the situation in Mali. So I have some questions to deal with. First of all, uh, what is the legal nature, the legal status of this provision, that is uh, paragraph 68 uh, of uh, the uh, Security Council res resolution at stake, and uh, uh, second, uh, who are the addresses uh, of uh, this uh, resolution? First of all, legal nature, legal status, uh, it is uh, abundantly clear that uh, a paragraph 68 uh, contains only uh, a mere recommendation. This is not a decision, it's only a recommendation, even though uh, the uh, resolution uh, 2423 is, uh, was adopted according to uh, the uh, chapter 7 powers of the UN Security Council. So the, uh, generally the resolution uh, contains uh, measures, uh, enforcement measures, uh, of course, uh, that uh, uh, are the expression of the exercise of coercive, coercive powers uh, by the Council, but uh, this single provision uh, may be regarded as a mere recommendation. I have uh, various evidence of my thesis, first of all, the wording of this paragraph. Uh, paragraph 68 is not couched in a mandatory language. The Security Council does not decide 
call upon or the mind, it simply notes the important to take into consideration as appropriate, so a very soft language. Second, as we shall see, the issue at stake is part of a, a conflict prevention strategy. Therefore, uh, we can conclude that this uh, the paragraph was, uh, was adopted within the uh, framework of uh, Chapter 6 uh, powers of the United Nations uh, Charter, powers of the Security Council, so recommendatory, conciliatory powers. Finally, uh, the mere recommendatory effect of this provision is uh, implicitly confirmed by uh, the uh, discussions that uh, uh, preceded the adoption of uh, this resolution and that I mentioned before uh, referring to the statement by uh, the Russian Federation. So if uh, we can conclude that uh, we are dealing with a mere recommendation, I would only like uh, to uh, draw your attention on uh, the fact uh, that uh, um, all uh, member states of the United Nations and uh, all bodies of this organization are expected uh, to um, implement any measure uh, by the Security Council, including uh, even a recommendatory measure in good faith. In good faith. Uh, this means that uh, they are expected to make uh, all reasonable efforts to integrate the climate-related effects within the plane activities in Africa. Second, who are the addresses of uh, this uh, recommendation? It is uh, um, very clear, Mali, first of all, the Malian authorities uh, and uh, the uh, UN as a whole. Uh, Mali, uh, I have uh, no time to enter in any detail, but uh, it is uh, rather clear that uh, the Malian government uh, is uh, not, uh, is unable to exercise an effective control over its territory. Um, we have a lot of documents by the UN showing this matter of fact, and actually it is the same Malian government that admits this state of weaknesses in its governmental action. Um, I, uh, let me only recall that, that uh, last spring um, uh, elections were held in a very difficult uh, context in Mali due to the COVID-19 restrictions, but also um, due to uh, several uh, incidents, including uh, the kidnapping of uh, various uh, um, electoral officials by uh, extremists, by violent extremists, uh, and the kidnap kidnapping of the major opposition leader, Sumaila Sisse. So uh, we are dealing uh, uh, with a situation um, where uh, Mali, the Malian government uh, can uh, um, fulfill uh, the uh, recommendation at stake by uh, the Security Council at stake uh, only with the strong support of uh, the international community and the UN as a whole. United Nations is the second addressee of the uh, recommendation at stake. Obviously, United Nations is to be intended very broadly, including all its uh, uh, internal bodies, uh, international agency, uh, primary and uh, uh, subsidiary bodies. A subsidiary body, for instance, uh, is a MINUSMA. Um, for time restrictions, uh, I will only focus uh, on uh, the specific role played by MINUSMA in the implementation of this uh, recommendation. And uh, uh, I would only like uh, to uh, stress that uh, MINUSMA is uh, a huge uh, peace uh, operation, uh, including uh, uh, 15,000 units, military, police, uh, and civilian personnel, which are contributed by uh, 57 countries. MINUSMA is a robust peacekeeping uh, operation, uh, which has been uh, authorized by the Council to use uh, all necessary means uh, to carry out uh, its uh, mandate. 
The mandate of MINUSMA is very broad uh, because uh, MINUSMA is uh, required to ensure a deterrent presence uh, in uh, Mali, uh, in particular in the northern part of the country, but uh, also since uh, 2018 uh, in the central part of uh, this uh, country, in the Mopti region, where the, the uh, intercommunal conflicts uh, are uh, occurring. And uh, second, uh, MINUSMA is also required uh, to support the Malian authorities uh, to reduce uh, intercommunal conflict uh, through mediation, good offices uh, and uh, reconciliation, to ensure uh, the uh, respect of uh, human uh, rights against uh, any form of abuses, and finally to contrast uh, impunity. So uh, MINUSMA can play a very important uh, role uh, in preventing and uh, suppressing certain uh, severity, uh, security implication on uh, climate change. What are the major strengths and uh, open uh, challenges uh, of uh, this uh, recommendation? In my opinion, uh, there are uh, two major strengths. That is, uh, 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 the adoption of a preventive and comprehensive and integrated approach to this severe challenge. Um, starting from the comprehensive and integrated approach, I would like to recall that a cross-pillar approach, environment, development, human rights, peace and security, is uh, consistent with uh, a general principle of international environmental law that is uh, the principle, the so-called principle of integration, uh, which is uh, set forth, uh, which was uh, set forth for the third time, uh, first time at uh, the UN level by uh, the 1992 Rio Declaration on Sustainable Development. Um, it would be reductive, however, to limit the scope of the principle of integration to the reconciliation between the three components of a sustainable development, namely economic growth, social development, and environmental protection. Obviously, integration requires not only a better coordination between different subjects and initiatives, to avoid the duplicative or confront of conflicting approaches, but also a coherent and a coordinated policy and decision making across institutions, both horizontally and vert vertically. This is a clear statement by the International Law Association in made in 2006. But are the United Nations prepared to lead this process. If we look at the UN legal framework, legal order, order a legal framework for institutional integration may be found in the UN Charter and in some general principles of law. First, uh, we have uh, uh, the uh, duty of uh, cooperation uh, stated uh, under Article 2 of uh, the UN Charter and uh, in uh, Article 48 of the same instrument. But uh, these are very general uh, soft provisions. Uh, there is only a general principle of uh, cooperation in good faith. faith. Uh, the second element is represented by Chapter 8 of the UN Charter that provides the legal basis for cooperation between the UN and the regional organizations in the maintenance of peace and security. Um, unfortunately, however, um, the UN, uh, the United Nations have uh, never concluded uh, agreements, or at least uh, uh, never adopted a huge legal framework in order to regulate very sensitive, uh, crucial aspects relating, for instance, the uh, division, uh, the uh, coordination of competition, uh, um, coordination of the competencies between uh, different uh, subjects. Uh, and uh, above all, uh, in order to uh, clear um, 
very delicate uh, aspects uh, as, uh, for instance, instance uh, responsibility uh, for uh, collateral effects uh, or unexpected effects uh, of these uh, actions. Um, at the um, concrete level, uh, conflict pre prevention and uh, comprehensive and integrated approach, I uh, can uh, remark that uh, MINUSMA uh, is uh, addressing uh, uh, climate change related, uh, related conflicts uh, at their roots. Uh, as I mentioned before, there are many several aspects. Uh, for instance, uh, its uh, a civil affairs division uh, was uh, strengthened in uh, 2019 in order uh, to provide a stronger support uh, to the uh, national government uh, and civil society uh, to ensure reconciliation and mediation services. And uh, it is a matter of fact that uh, thanks to this support, um, MINUSMA was uh, able to facilitate initiatives uh, that led to the signing of uh, a number of peace agreements, uh, local peace agreements, uh, uh, between various uh, communities. It is also uh, to uh, stress, uh, to underscore that, that the MINUSMA civilian components uh, has, recently, has recently been strengthened in the Mopti region, uh, in particular in uh, central Mali, where violent clashes uh, between artists and farmers uh, are more numerous and frequent. Uh, it, can let, it cannot be overlooked, uh, however, that the structural problems uh, may affect uh, the positive uh, outcome uh, of the entire process. Uh, in particular, MINUSMA, as I said before, is a large uh, multidimensional operation uh, with the mandate to pursue a variety of complex uh, objectives in a high, highly unstable and uh, dangerous uh, context. There are budget, budgetary pressures and finally, the Security Council has been consistently called in the past to adopt a different strategy in planning peace operations, avoiding on the one hand over ambitious mandates, the so called, I quote, Christmas tree mandates, and a disparity between mandate and resources, on the other hand. It can hardly be said whether, whether Christmas is uh, really over. Uh, with respect uh, to integration, uh, it is uh, to be stressed uh, that uh, uh, in the past, uh, uh, the effective implementation of the MINUSMA mandate has been undermined by a gap in the integration and the complementarity of its uh, personnel at uh, the organizational and operational level. Recently, uh, two strategic uh, uh, plans uh, have been adopted in order to enhance the complementarity of uh, skills and uh, coordinated approach across its uh, civilian, military, and uh, police units. Um, and uh, at the same time, in order uh, to enhance uh, a better uh, cooperation uh, with external cooperation with uh, other uh, subjects uh, we are uh, on the ground uh, in uh, Mali, in particular uh, uh, cooperation with uh, uh, regional and uh, sub regional organizations, uh, as for instance uh, uh, the African Union, uh, ECOVAS, uh, or the European uh, Euro Union. But uh, in uh, any way, we have uh, uh, clear weaknesses uh, in uh, general because this is a, a very recent uh, uh, approach uh, and uh, uh, above all, uh, all uh, activities, uh, all uh, undertakings uh, by MINUSMA are essentially characterized by a short-term uh, approach while, uh, while we know that uh, uh, climate-related effects uh, need a long-term vision, a long-term uh, uh, approach that is uh, obviously outside uh, the, uh, the mandate and the uh, possibilities, uh, the capacities, uh, the uh, concrete capacities of these operations. In conclusion, what are my uh, uh, essential remarks? Uh, an overall assessment of uh, the uh, various actions uh, that uh, have been uh, undertaken by the United Nations 
after the adoption of the resolution 2423 highlights uh, positive aspects but also various uh, weaknesses. On the side of the positive aspects, let me quote uh, first uh, the fact that the uh, UN recommendation may be considered as a first attempt of the Council to move from discussion to action with regard to climate change and security issues. Obviously, uh, we have seen uh, some UN Security Council permanent members uh, con continue to be skeptical about uh, a, a, more, a stronger role played by uh, and the Council, a stronger involvement of the Council with the climate change issues. However, uh, this, uh, res uh, this uh, resolution, this recommendation represents uh, a precedent in the UN practice that uh, cannot be neglected. In addition, a considerable advance on previous uh, Security Council practice is uh, represented by the adoption of uh, a preventive and uh, integrated uh, approach to the root causes of crisis and tensions, uh, including climate change. This must, might be taken for granted, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, yet uh, I have uh, to uh, remark that uh, theoretical assertions have been uh, rarely translated into concrete actions in the UN practice. There are, however, also uh, structural problems. It cannot be uh, neglected uh, that uh, these uh, problems uh, may uh, seriously affect uh, the fulfillment uh, of the objectives uh, uh, pursued by the Security Council recommendation. In particular, the groundbreaking approach adopted by the Council is not uh, supported by uh, innovative means. In particular, again, uh, uh, multidimensional threats uh, and uh, uh, complex uh, security issues uh, are tackled by uh, the Security Council within uh, a legal framework that uh, remained uh, substantially unchanged uh, since 1945. And with the support of uh, operational means, uh, first uh, uh, peace operation, uh, whose uh, reform has been uh, repeatedly called for without, however, a substantial revision being really undertaken. Should we therefore conclude that the Security Council lacks the necessary competence to deal with the climate change issues and the detrimental effects as some states claim? In my opinion, the problem is not to be uh, seen in an alleged lack of competence by the Council. The fundamental question instead is rather to be found in the shortage of adequate means specifically tailored to address the complexity of the new challenges. I mean, multidimensional threats require a multidimensional strategy both at the legal and the institutional level in accordance with an integrated approach with the support of highly competent subjects from different national and international bodies and institutions and with the support of highly competent subjects who work synergically within a clear legal framework. In conclusion, returning uh, to my initial quest question, new wine in all bottles, uh, or a first step towards a change uh, in the security architecture of the organization, of the organization. it can be argued that, that some new wine, but perhaps not so, so new, has been added in the old bottles of the UN legal and institutional framework. More structural changes have yet to be adopted to reshape and strengthen the capacity of the United Nations system to address climate change as a non-traditional security challenge in the Sahel region. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for your insightful presentation. Now we can start for a question time. So, uh, Major Gilling, do we have questions? Yeah, thank you very much, Colonel. The first question is actually from myself. I've just sent it, uh, Professor, to you on private chat. 
look for everybody else's benefit if we accept that the construct of the United, United Nations Security Council prevents stronger language in resolutions and more decisive action on the ground, do you think it is appropriate for regional intergovernmental organisations such as the EU or indeed NATO to play a greater role in their near abroad such as Sub Sahara Africa? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, I'm uh, firmly convinced uh, that uh, there is uh, uh, the um, possibility for a uh, regional organization, uh, first uh, a European uh, Union, uh, to play a greater role uh, in uh, the uh, Sahel and uh, in uh, Western Sahara. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, it is a matter of fact that, for instance, both uh, the European Union and uh, NATO integrated uh, in uh, the uh, strategy, uh, overall strategy, uh, integrated the climate change effects in their strategy. Unfortunately, um, if uh, I uh, focus uh, on uh, the EU approach, it is uh, a matter of fact uh, that, uh, in principle, uh, we have uh, several declarations, uh, a great concern by the European Union uh, for um, climate-related effects uh, as a security uh, problem in general. Unfortunately, if we look at uh, the uh, external uh, action, uh, external uh, um, policy adopted by the European Union, uh, we cannot uh, see any change in uh, the institutional uh, structure uh, in accordance uh, with uh, uh, this uh, uh, important uh, objective. So, uh, also within the European Union, uh, we have uh, a formal uh, approach, uh, but uh, there is uh, still a lack of a concrete integration of uh, uh, this objective in uh, its uh, uh, usual, in its uh, daily uh, job uh, at uh, the level of uh, its external relations. Second, there is uh, the, um, the lack of, uh, I mentioned before, of a strong legal framework uh, which can ensure a good coordination um, between the activities on the one hand of UN actors and uh, regional, on the one hand, and regional actors on the other. Uh, obviously, I consider this uh, aspect uh, uh, in my perspective uh, as a lawyer that uh, we are dealing with uh, uh, very sensitive and delicate uh, issues. Uh, first, uh, the uh, sharing of uh, obligations uh, and uh, responsibility. Who uh, is responsible in the end for these uh, uh, actions uh, and uh, above all, uh, uh, instinctively, I could say uh, that uh, the Security Council is in the, should be in the best uh, po position uh, to coordinate uh, all of these uh, actions. But uh, this is not possible without uh, a concrete. Uh, uh, agreements uh, with, without uh, uh, legal rules uh, effectively regulating uh, single uh, undertakings uh, and, uh, and uh, responsibilities. So um, I, I hope to, be, have, uh, uh, to have been sufficiently clear. Uh, in other words, I mean, it's not a sufficient, a simple sum of the competencies, or a simple sum of vectors um, dealing on the same matters. We need an integration of a competence and of course we need the capacity first of a genuine dialogue between these different actors and uh, uh, not uh, a framework with the, which is based uh, in the end on an uh, uh, approach to, on a case of case basis. Thank you, Professor. But, uh, yeah, I'll pass you now to Warrant Officer Gennaro, who's got a uh, question. One moment. Yes, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, good morning, Professor. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for your lecture, very enriching. So uh, I would like to ask you about uh, what are the main obstacles to the global wording adaptation and mitigation solutions are encountered in Africa? 
so uh, please. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thank you for your uh, question. Um, yes, uh, first of all, uh, what are the major obstacles um, uh, met by uh, uh, African countries? Uh, and I would like to add also by other states uh, uh, at the right. global level, considering uh, that uh, climate change is uh, a global uh, challenge. Uh, because uh, every state contributes uh, to, climate ch uh, to climate change uh, phenomena and every state uh, is affected by detrimental uh, uh, changes uh, caused by climate change. First of all, I would like to uh, recall that uh, uh, African states, uh, the, the contribution of uh, African states to climate change is a very minor contribution uh, because of uh, the overall status of their um, domestic economies, uh, lack of infrastructures and so on. It is also evident that these countries are particularly vulnerable to climate change. I would like to recall, for instance, that the Sahel region has faced, during the last decades, a consistent increase in temperature between 1.5 and 2 degrees in far eastern Chad, for instance, yeah. and in the northern regions of Mali and Mauritania. And uh, there was also a consistent variability in uh, precipitation with the persistent drought, but also torrential rains uh, and uh, frequent uh, floodings. So the scenario is uh, sufficiently uh, clear. At the same time, uh, at the same time, uh, we have uh, uh, not only wet economies, uh, but also a uh, wet uh, state. Uh, um, in, uh, institutions, infrastructures, because um, mo several uh, um, Sahelian states, uh, states of the Sahel region, are parties, uh, for instance, uh, to the uh, Climate Change Agreement, to the UN Climate Change Agreement, but uh, obviously uh, the uh, contribution uh, uh, may be considered very modest uh, as a whole because uh, they lack the instruments uh, to prevent a certain uh, phenomena in uh, a very effective way. There is a practical aspect. I will refer in particular to uh, the proliferation of the so-called public-private partnerships in various African countries, in particular in the Democratic Republic, Democratic Republic of Congo. There are some interesting precedents, in particular it, there was an undertaking by Congo to abstain from deforestation in uh, for a long period of uh, time, uh, thanks to the support of uh, uh, private uh, partnerships. But in the end, I'm convinced that uh, the uh, more important if effort is to be expected by uh, developed countries, Western countries, above all the countries who majorly uh, contribute uh, to um, climate uh, change emission uh, in the atmosphere in general. And uh, you know, uh, it is very well known that, uh, unfortunately, uh, the uh, major powers uh, are, uh, that are more contribute uh, to these emissions uh, uh, continue to resist uh, to give implementation uh, to the uh, ICC Convention and uh, the Paris Agreement uh, as well, uh, the Paris Agreement uh, of uh, 2015. So, uh, I'm uh, firmly convinced uh, that, uh, of course, uh, we need uh, uh, um, a strong undertaking, undertaking at the international level uh, in order to meet uh, this uh, challenge. But uh, this, uh, this undertaking need, uh, needs uh, to start uh, from uh, concrete initiatives uh, at the national level, uh, at the national level of all states. Without uh, this uh, undertaking, uh, it's not uh, possible uh, to change uh, the general approach at the international level. Thanks. Thank you very much for your exhaustive uh, reply. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a question?
Yes, I had a question, but she already replied now uh, because she gave the example of Congo, the president of Congo and deforestation, because my question was uh, regarding some examples of virtuous initiative uh, in global warming mitigation uh, and how much this initiative can have an impact on the, on the flow of migrants. This is my question, but you almost reply me if you have any other examples of virtuous initiative and how much the private and the organization are involved in this. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, this is uh, a central remark. Uh, first of all, uh, it is uh, uh, evident that the impact uh, of uh, global warming uh, changes uh, on uh, migration. And uh, implicitly uh, in uh, my presentation, uh, I uh, stressed uh, the um, striking interconnection between uh, uh, intercommunal conflicts on the one hand uh, and uh, uh, the displacement, the huge displacement of uh, a civilians uh, that we are assisting uh, in central Mali in uh, this uh, period. Obviously this is uh, an additional threat uh, to uh, the stability of the entire region, that is uh, other uh, African countries, uh, but also for other uh, countries, uh, first of all, uh, the European Union uh, as a whole. Uh, so uh, it, is, uh, it is evident that it is a very urgent uh, the uh, adoption of a comprehensive approach to this uh, problem. Um, concrete impact of uh, this uh, strategy uh, by uh, um, private uh, uh, actors. Um, before uh, replying uh, to this uh, question, let me um, draw your attention to one aspect that I, not, don't, I didn't mention before. That is, uh, um, in a paragraph, uh, under paragraph 67 of uh, resolution 2324, uh, there is a, a recommendation to MINUSMA to, I quote, to um, taking into account its uh, footprint, uh, ecological footprint uh, in the organization of uh, its uh, uh, activities in Mali. Uh, you perfectly know that uh, uh, this uh, aspect uh, is uh, widely considered, uh, not only uh, at the United Nations, but uh, I, I know within the NATO, is, uh, there is a uh, um, great concern for, for this aspect, uh, and this is uh, a very positive uh, development. MINUSMA was uh, the first uh, peace, UN peace operation uh, to be invited uh, to take uh, into account uh, of its uh, food, uh, ecological footprint. It is obvious, however, that this footprint is very modest if compared with the severe impact of the other industrialized, of many industrialized countries over global warming. Finally, a concrete strategy by private actors. The partnership, the partnerships I mentioned before are a very um, interesting precedence. In particular, I refer to the so-called RED uh, process. Um, honestly, I, there is the, also the other side of the coins. It's not so easy uh, to coordinate uh, actions uh, between local actors, national actors, and foreign uh, private uh, companies or foreign um, L L L NGOs. Uh, this is a matter of a culture, first of all. Uh, there is a, a huge problem of education. Uh, and uh, uh, again, there is a problem of uh, a, a long-term strategy. So it is uh, obvious uh, local population are pressed by uh, the solution of uh, urgent uh, practical needs. So it's very difficult uh, to uh, press uh, the uh, domestic uh, actors uh, to, um, to, to set aside the immediate uh, objectives uh, in order uh, to have uh, uh, to, to meet uh, the long-term uh, objectives. But, uh, you know, this is the same uh, problem so within our countries as well. This is a political problem, of course. 
Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your for your answering. Stuart? Yeah, sorry. Dominica, one final question. I'll just push it to the professor in text first. Um, I'll read it for everybody else. As climate change occurs, the effects are likely to accelerate existing conflicts for resources such as water and arable land. Professor, do you think that we in NATO and indeed the EU need to redefine our understanding of security to include water and climate security? Thank you for your question. Um, I don't think that uh, there is a need to redefine understanding of a security, including water and climate security within NATO and uh, the European Union, because uh, as I mentioned before, uh, this uh, need is uh, absolutely clear in the uh, all official documents of uh, the two of the two organizations uh, and also within the UN uh, I uh, should add the problem is uh, to uh, achieve a coherence between theory and uh, practice and uh, this coherence uh, can be met only by uh, the reorganization of uh, institutional structures and uh, legal, uh, legal uh, frameworks. So uh, I'm sorry if I repeat always uh, this uh, mantra. I hope this is not a mantra uh, because I'm uh, firmly convinced of uh, this uh, need. Obviously, it, it is, uh, it, this depends uh, by the political will uh, of uh, um, member states of uh, all international organizations, but I completely agree with uh, uh, General Gramble's uh, uh, initial remarks. Uh, we uh, risk uh, uh, to uh, be to arrive entirely uh, late with um, to face entirely predictable challenges. We all are perfectly aware that we are facing these challenges, but unfortunately, let me add this my personal conviction, unfortunately, political leaders are more concerned with the electoral pressures instead of more urgent global needs at the world level, at the national and world level. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank and you. with that, I will pass back to uh, Major General Bramble. Yes, but thank you, General. Thank you, Professor. Um, I just, I, I've got one question, if I may, um, before concluding. The, it seems to me that um, Paris Accord and other initiatives uh, multilateral initiatives to deal with climate change have not had perhaps the momentum and traction because as you say the most important powers have not taken the leadership steps they should have the US perhaps being the current example um, and equally there are other developing nations that are principal emitters um, in, in terms of uh, uh, global warming that again are not perhaps taking the steps they ought to. Has there been any modeling, scientific modeling, to underpin predictions of not only warming, but population migration based on demographics that then leads to instability and potential conflicts. And I think the, the modelling that, of course, might make a difference is the cost in financial terms uh, to those developed nations for not taking action now. And if, if there is some modeling that can underpin those financial predictions, that might change behavior. But only when, when the cash matters will nations start to think differently, it seems to me. Uh, and even then it's difficult because of course, 
elected premiers and presidents run on normally a four or five year campaign. And therefore, they're always thinking about re-election two years into their term of office. And therefore, only look out at any point in time about three years. But I just wonder what sort of modelling has been done to, 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 to show some predictions. Uh, thank you, General Bramble. Uh, unfortunately, as far as I know, there are no scientific uh, modeling uh, in order uh, to prove uh, um, the, uh, or in order to give uh, uh, reliable uh, uh, projections uh, about uh, population migration and uh, um, global warming. Um, um, at the legal level, I could uh, say uh, that uh, there is uh, a um, basic principle, that is uh, the uh, precautionary principle, that uh, would be sufficient to induce uh, governments uh, to consider that uh, there is, uh, it is not proved that there is this concrete risk, but there is a highly a high possibility in the future to have uh, this uh, situation. But uh, uh, I, uh, let me disagree on uh, one aspect. Uh, you uh, said uh, that uh, the most important powers uh, uh, are not uh, leading this uh, global process uh, in the uh, containment of uh, the global war the, uh, warming phenomenon. It is true if uh, we refer to the uh, United States, uh, uh, to Russia, China is uh, something is uh, moving, but uh, I uh, will be very cautious uh, in this uh, statement. But uh, there is uh, one actor who is uh, uh, playing a, a very strong role uh, at the world level in order to push uh, states uh, to a higher uh, um, uh, objectives uh, in uh, uh, this uh, struggle, and that is the European Union. In the absence, uh, absent of these uh, major actors, it is a matter of fact uh, that uh, we have uh, to recognize that the merit of the European Union uh, to uh, have uh, uh, exercised, uh, uh, to have played uh, a major role during the negotiations, uh, for instance, uh, of uh, the Paris Agreement. So this is a, a very uh, positive starting point. However, when the European Union is required to translate these uh, uh, great underta undertakings at the practical level, uh, these undertakings uh, as uh, conceived um, as uh, a security issue, we have only uh, the very vague declarations. We do not have yet a systematic policy on this front. So there is a great failure in the European Union at this stage in its, as I said before, in the organization of its external policy and inclusion of climate change as a security issue in this, this level. So I don't know if uh, I uh, uh, answered, um, uh, sufficiently answered uh, your question, but I'm ready to, uh, to give a further information or further remarks uh, if uh, you like. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, I, as I suspected, I, I've not seen any of that sort of extended modeling and it's probably very, very difficult to do because um, you, can, you can take the, the scientific data, but trying to model what that might mean in terms of conflict and impact is, is extremely challenging. Um, thank you. Uh, Stuart, Gianluca, anything else before I conclude? So no, there are no further questions, so if you'd like to uh, up. Thank you, um, Professor. So it just leaves me to say that was extremely um, provoking and stimulating. The one, the one benefit I would say that we have had during this terrible period of lockdown is we have managed to string together, as you saw from that opening video, some, some really uh, informative uh, seminars and lectures uh, uh, from some eminent professors. And, and this, of course, is just another example of, of what we've been able to do 
remote working on Zoom. In fact, I think for many of us, uh, the only other time we'd have had so many um, informative presentations were probably at the Staff College. So it's been, it's been fascinating listening to you this morning. It is a massive global challenge that, uh, that is going to increasingly impact on our lives over the next uh, few decades. Um, I just hope that, that the world will find the right solutions over the next few years to, to really adjust the current trajectory and course, um, of course, and change and change of course history. We hope, but uh, let's see. Let's see what materialises. But Professor, thank you very much from all of us this morning. It's been really uh, interesting. Thank you all. It was a pleasure.